Well, hello everyone, it's Jason here. I'm one of the pastors at The Way Church, and I wanna welcome you to today's sermon. I don't know where you find yourself, but it's a delight for our team whenever we hear stories of people being strengthened in their walk with God, discovering more about Jesus and his word through these messages. So just wanted to say hello before we jump in and hope that you enjoy. All right, good morning. We're gonna be reading from Exodus 20, verses one to 17. So if you'd join me the Ten Commandments. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I The Lord your God, I'm a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day is the Sabbath day to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreign residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant or his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of the Lord. Will you pray with me? Living God, you have just spoken and you will keep speaking. So will you open our ears? Will you declutter our minds? Will you melt our hearts? And will you free our wills to willingly submit to your will? For we pray this in the name of your will made flesh, in the name of Jesus, amen. On the Sundays of this fall, beginning this Sunday, we as the Way Church are going to make our way. I worked on that sentence a long time. (laughs) We as the Way Church are going to make our way through the words we just read in Exodus 20, through the words which now for centuries have come to be known as the Ten Commandments. When the authors of the Bible, especially the Old Testament, but also the New Testament, speak of the way as walk in the way, They are referring to, at minimum, the way that is unfolded in the Ten Commandments. Some of you know these words very well and seek to live them. Some of you have heard the words many times but have not given that much serious attention to them. Some of you have never heard the words, like most people in our day. Today might have been the very first time you heard these words. I grew up in a time when these words were very familiar, even if not faithfully practiced by all who heard them. I grew up in a time when you could find these words printed on the walls of public school classrooms, teachers, can you imagine that? And on courts of law, lawyers, can you imagine that? I grew up in a time when the words were recited nearly every Sunday in public worship, leading up to a prayer of confession, acknowledging that we have not kept these words, 
followed by the reciting of the Apostles' Creed, leading to the great declaration, I believe in the forgiveness of sin. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm feeling a tad awkward. That's the best word I could come up with. As we are bothering to do a series in the Ten Commandments in this city in our time. I'm not ashamed that we're doing the series, and I'm not afraid to do it. I just feel awkward. Why? Because this era of history is marked by antinomianism and autonomy. Antinomianism. Anti, against, nomos, law. Throwing off any law that gets in the way of us wanting our way and thinking that one is above the law. Autonomy. Auto, self, nomos, law. Self, law. The rule of the self, by the self, for the self. No one is going to tell me how to run my life. I make my own rules. Giving attention to the commandments, to God's good commandments in our time, could easily be judged as hopelessly out of touch with the, things, with the way things are in the real world, like totally on the wrong side of history. And giving attention to these commandments could easily be charged as moving back toward repression, if not or outward oppression. And we could be judged as non-gospel. The way church seeks to be a gospel church, alive in the good news of Jesus, living the good news of Jesus, sharing the good news of Jesus, inviting our culture to join us in the good news of Jesus. How can we do this while giving an in-depth study to commandments spoken so long ago? What do commandments have to do with the gospel? Now, it may surprise you to learn that the event described in Exodus 20, the giving of the law, as the commandments came to be called, was celebrated in ancient Israel with great joy. Great joy. Really? Joy that God spoke commandments? Yes. People celebrated the giving of the law as a gift, as a great gift of great grace. Words of command as grace? Really? As one Old Testament scholar put it, God's declaring the Ten Commandments was celebrated as a saving act of the highest order. A saving act? Speaking rules to live by is an act of salvation? Why? Well, the answer is found in asking a prior question. Why did the God, whose name is Yahweh, speak these words? Why did the God who comes to us in Jesus Christ speak commandments? Now, the event took place some 3,500 years ago, in 1,500 B.C. Hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children were making their way across the Sinai Desert to what would be called the Promised Land. Talk about mass evacuation. They had just been liberated from years of bondage and oppression in the land of Egypt. It was one of the largest refugee movements in the history of the world. They had made their way to the foot of Mount Sinai. Those of you who know the larger biblical story, aren't you taken by the fact that so much of the story takes place at mountains? On that particular day, the mountain became engulfed by smoke, which seemed to be pouring out of a fire on the top of a mountain. Not hard to imagine in light of what we've experienced in the last weeks. Lightning flashed through the thickening smoke. There was what sounded like trumpets blaring. The people, understandably, stood at the mountain in great awe, and they feared for their lives, and they especially feared for their friend Moses. For while the lightning flashed and the trumpets blared and the ground shook, Moses was up there on the mountain. The living God had called Moses up there. Exodus 19, verse 20. And the Lord came down on Mount Sinai, on top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, into the midst of all the fire and the smoke. After a period of anxious waiting, Moses comes down from the mountain, and to everyone's relief, he is unharmed. No burn marks. 
His face, however, glowed with the reflected glory he had experienced on the mountain. And he had a word from the one he met on the mountain. A word from the God whose name is Yahweh, the great I am. More exactly, Moses had 10 words from Yahweh, and more exactly, the 10 words had Moses. Now, as I said, this event, Israel would then celebrate as a great act of saving grace. So much so that Israel, at the direction of the great I am, established an annual week-long celebration of the gift of the commandments. Imagine that. Israel observed three major annual feasts, Passover, Tabernacles, and Pentecost. They were, and still are, as big a deal as Christmas, Good Friday, and Easter. Passover celebrates the Exodus, God liberating Israel from 400 years of bondage, from 400 years of laboring as slaves for the pharaohs. Tabernacles celebrates God's gracious provision during the 40 years spent wandering in the desert. God guided the people with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. God caused water and honey to flow from the rocks and bread to be on the ground in the morning. God even chose to dwell among his people in a tent called the tabernacle, hence the name of the feast. And Pentecost, the word means 50th, referring to 50 days after Passover. And it celebrated the gift of the law, the gift of commandments. And the dominant note of that celebration is joy. Imagine that. People celebrating with joy that someone broke into their lives and spoke commandments. Now, it may also surprise you to learn that nearly every great renewal movement in the life of, his, of, of Israel, nearly every great spiritual awakening was caused on the human level anyway by the rediscovery of these commandments, by the recovery of the law. A number of times in Israel's history, the nation began to drift from Yahweh and their common life began to break down. It's always what happens when we drift from the living God. Leaders began to lose their moral compass. Corruption infiltrated every level of government. Marriages began to fall apart, mostly due to husbands committing adultery. The poor and needy were rejected. Justice was perverted. The gap between the rich and the poor widened. And people no longer pursued Yahweh with passion. Someone, a prophet or priest, finds a copy of the long-neglected law reads it, is stunned into repentance and stirred into joy. The person then brings a copy of the law to the king and his cabinet. They read it, they're stunned into repentance and they're stirred into joy. The king then calls a, nat a national assembly where the law, the commandments, are read out loud and the people are stunned into repentance and stirred into joy. Amazing. It happened during the time of King uh, Josiah and King Hezekiah and in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. And I submit to you that it could happen again in our time. The rediscovery of God's good commandments would result in a massive transformation of our society. If I'm reading the cultural landscape correctly, there is a deep hunger for order amidst the chaos. And so we have best-selling books like 12 Rules to Live By, subtitled An Antidote to Chaos, and followed by Beyond Order, 12 More Rules to Live By, and from another author, New 12 Rules for Life in a Digital Age. <laughs> Our antinomian, autonomous cultures are hungering for some sort of set of rules that help us actually function in our time. Antinomianism and autonomy are not working, and they're leading us to very disturbing places. People are longing for some sort of relational and moral stability, which is just why God spoke the Ten Commandments. Now, why? Why these particular commandments? Why do they lead us into full human flourishing? Because the one who gave us these particular commandments is the one who made us. The one who spoke these commandments is the one who spoke us into being. 
and because the one who spoke the commandments wants us to live, to live, to live the life he spoke us into being to enjoy. In the book of Deuteronomy, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Deutero, second, namas, law, Deuteronomy then meaning the second telling of the giving of the law. In Deuteronomy, Moses emphasizes the fact that in speaking the law, Yahweh is speaking life. Deuteronomy 4.1, God says, And now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and judgments which I'm teaching you to perform in order that you may live. Deuteronomy 5.29, God says, Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me, keep all my commandments always, that it may be well with them and with their children forever. And then one more, Deuteronomy 30, verses 15 to 16, Moses says, See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, in that I command you today to love Yahweh your God, keep his commandments, that you may live. Jesus would later reiterate this connection between law and live. Luke records the story of a lawyer who put Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Really good question. Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? How how do you read it? The lawyer answered, summarizing the Ten Commandments in two great commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus responds, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Do this and you live. Raising the question I will address later, but what if I cannot do this faithfully? For now... Hear the reason for the giving of the law, that you may live. To paraphrase the one whom Moses met on Mount Sinai, I speak these ten words that you may live the truly human life. Really? I hear the objection many followers of Jesus want to raise. Are the Ten Commandments still relevant For disciples of Jesus, who is the way? For disciples of Moses, of course. But for disciples of Jesus, does Jesus really want us to live attentive to the ancient law? Does he think the ancient law still unfolds for us the way, the way that leads to full human flourishing? Yes, as he makes clear in his great Sermon on the Mount. After speaking his Beatitudes, his famous blessed are lines, which turns our value system upside down, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 17 to 19, but do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the slightest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until it is all accomplished. For Jesus, the ancient law is as permanent as creation itself. So of course, following his law in some way is going to be involved in following him. But someone could press the objection just a little further saying, but are the Ten Commandments not given under the old covenant? And are we not in relationship with Jesus, living under a new covenant? The answer, of course, is yes. We are living under the new covenant, sealed by Jesus' blood. Hallelujah. But what, what does the new covenant entail? The content of the new covenant you can find in Jeremiah 31 and Hebrews 8 and 10. And it contains blessings like this. I will be your God. You will be my people. You will all know me. I will forgive your sins, and I will never remember your transgressions. Wow. Glory. Talk about gospel. And then the first line of the new covenant. I will put my laws in their minds, and I will write them upon their hearts. Under the old covenant, the commandments were written on tablets of stone. Moses comes down the mountain with God's will chiseled on two tablets. Under the new covenant, the commandments are written on tablets of flesh, and blood, and they're chiseled on our hearts and our minds, doing for us what King David David celebrates the law doing in Psalm 19, restoring the soul, making wise the simple, rejoicing the heart, and enlightening the eyes. Which is why the giving of the Ten Commandments was celebrated with great joy as a gift of grace, 
And which is why nearly every renewal movement in the history of God's people began with the rediscovery of the Ten Commandments. Now, on the Sundays to come, we are going to discover the grace in each of the commandments. For the rest of this message, I would like to identify a number of what I will call guardrails. Guardrails that will help us stay on the way that is unfolded in the commandments and keeping us from falling in the ditch on either side. Guardrails to help us then enter into the life God intends for us by obeying his commandments. Okay? Guardrails. That's the operative word for the rest of the time. Guardrail number one. The giver of the law loves us. The one who met Moses on the mountaintop loves us. I mean, the simple fact that Yahweh even spoke says he loves us. He could have left his people to try to figure out the way to human flourishing on their own, on our own. But he knows who we are. He made us, after all. Does not want us to miss out on the good life, which is why he says, I'm a jealous God. Exodus 20, verse 5. For I, Yahweh, your God, am a jealous God. It's the language of a lover. The living God is the lover of our souls, and he is jealous for us to experience the fullness of his love. So out of love, he graciously unfolds the way of the good life. This is critical to grasp and remember. Yahweh speaks his Torah, that's the Hebrew word for law, because he loves us. More on this next Sunday. Guardrail two, related to number one, keeping the commandments does not gain a relationship with the living God. The relationship with God is established by God, unilaterally, before he speaks any of the commandments. This, too, is critical to grasp. Let me ask you, what is the opening line of the law? Your answer will make all the difference in the world. Most will say the opening of the law, line of the law is, you shall have no other gods before me. But that's not the opening line. The opening line is, I am Yahweh, your God. God initiates a relationship with us before speaking any commandments, meaning keeping the commandments is not how we get in on a relationship with the holy God. Keeping the commandments is the way we experience relationship with God, as I will try to show in a moment. But keeping the commandments does not earn the relationship. Or to put it differently, God moves toward us in grace before speaking any commandment. Meaning, keeping the commandments is not how human beings find favor with God. Obedience certainly enhances the experience of favor with God, but it does not win his favor. Now, this is where the Pharisees of Jesus' day went off the rails. They were so demanding of themselves and others because in their minds, law-keeping is how humans enter into communion with the holy God. They even came up with a host of other commandments which, if kept, would supposedly guarantee obedience to the Big Ten. This is why they were so upset with Jesus. Jesus welcomed people into friendship with him without telling them that they first had to keep the law and shape up. The first line of the law is, I am Yahweh your God. I am Yahweh your God is covenantal language. The first line is, I've already established a covenant with you. I've already established a relationship with you. I've already initiated a relationship with you. And then comes, you shall have no other gods before me. But of course, or better, you shall not allow any other gods to come between us. But of course. Guardrail number three, also related to number one, the lawgiver loves us. Keeping the commandments is not the way to get free. God sets us free before speaking the commandments. Again, what is the first line of the law? I am Yahweh your God who brought you out of the house of slavery. The com- keeping the commandments is not the way to get free. It is the way to live in freedom, but it is not the way to get free. Or to make the point more boldly, keeping the commandments is not the way to get saved. Israel is saved before given the law. Israel is saved by grace before receiving the law. God had rescued the slaves from and for, from bondage and oppression, for relationship and therefore freedom. That's how it always is with the holy God. Setting us free from in order to be free for. 
Now, this is what the Apostle Paul was fighting for in his letters to the Galatians and the Romans, the so-called freedom letters. Paul realized that Israel of old, wanted Israel of old to realize that they had turned the gift of grace into the means to get grace. But the text in Exodus 20 is clear. The law comes after grace as a gift of grace given to help us live in grace. Some of us still seem to think that the first line of the law is, keep these commandments and I will love you and free you. No, a thousand times no. The first line can be fair, paraphrased. I am your, I'm Yahweh, your God, who already loves you, who has already acted to free you. You are already mine before I tell you anything more. Guardrail number four. God speaks the commandments to protect and enhance. God speaks the commandments to protect and enhance the relationship he's already established with us. And God speaks the commandments to protect and enhance the freedom he's already won. The first three commandments protect and enhance a relationship with God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or an image of me. You shall not take or bear my name in vain. In those three commandments, the first ones, God is freeing us by warning us of our capacity for idolatry and therefore protecting us from idolatry. I think it was Martin Luther who said, the human heart is a great idol factory. <laughs> Tell me about it. For we are not only made by the living God, we are made for the living God. And if we allow any God, however good, to take the place only God can have in our lives, it will not go well with us. Yahweh alone can fulfill the deepest longings of the human heart. That's a great compliment, by the way. God is complimenting human beings. You are so grandly made that only God can finally fill your soul. And for our sakes, Yahweh calls us to this exclusive allegiance. I'm a jealous God who passionately desires relationship with you, and I will not tolerate any false levers between us. Bless his holy name. And for our sake, God forbids making any likeness of God. In the words of Old Testament scholar Alan Cole, no likeness could possibly be adequate, and each type of image would imprint its own misunderstanding of God on our hearts. God wants us to know God as God really is. And for our sake, God calls us not to take his name in vain. He gave us his name, Yahweh. I love that song. We'd love to shout your name, Yahweh, so that we would call on his name in trouble and distress, so that we might experience intimacy with him. Joy Davidman, who married C.S. Lewis and was his intellectual equal, says of the first three commandments, they are given to free us from little gods in order for relationship with the one true living God. The fourth commandment protects and enhances a balanced life. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Here God sets us free from rat raceness for human raceness. Oh, how the Hebrew slaves must have rejoiced over this commandment. They lived all their lives working all day as slaves. And Yahweh now speaks profound freedom. Freedom, not to mention effectiveness, is found in this six plus one rhythm. Six days of work, one day of rest. I believe that much of the anxiety and sickness of modern life is fundamentally due to ignoring God's Sabbath law. And I believe that much sanity and wholeness would return if we obeyed. Commandments five through 10 protect and enhance our relationship with the community. And God begins with the relationship closest to us, the one with our parents. Commandment five, honor your father and mother. Honor means more than obey. It means highly prized, show respect for, take care of. The, the fifth commandment is given to protect us in our old age and to safeguard the aged within the community. I'm loving this commandment more and more as the weeks go by. <laughs> commandment six, you shall not murder safeguards our neighbor's physical life. Commandment seven, you shall not commit adultery, safeguards our neighbor's marriage. Commandment eight, you shall not steal, safeguards our neighbor's property. And commandment 10, you shall not bear false witness, safeguards our neighbor's reputation. Oh, how foolish to throw away God's good words. 
Because once we play around with these commandments, the fabric of community begins to unravel and we return to bondage. Which is why the psalmist prayed in Psalm 119, verse 136, my eyes shed streams of water because they do not keep your law. Now the key commandment that protects and enhances the life of freedom is the 10th. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or female servant or his ox or his donkey or his new Tesla or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Here God is protecting us from ourselves. God enhances freedom by telling us about our hearts, reminding us that our hearts have a tendency to crave what is not our own. Again, tell me about it. Here God calls us to examine and in check the unspoken desires and yearnings. If I crave my neighbor's spouse long enough, the desire gives birth to fantasizing, which one day leads to action. If I crave my neighbor's status long enough, the desire can move me to either try to usurp her position or whittle her down by spreading rumors. The living God wants us to live and so protects us against the sin that is still in our hearts. Isn't he good? (laughs) Now, the fact is, breaking the 10th commandment, you shall not covet, is the greatest sign that we've already broken the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Because coveting is a sign that we are at that particular moment living for another God, craving well, will ultimately not satisfy. The sign that we are living in an exclusive relationship with Yahweh is contentment. Contentment with Yahweh and his love. Yahweh is my shepherd, I, I shall not want. Now, I would imagine that at this point, many of you are asking the question, my soul is asking, how? How in the world am I going to live this way of life unfolded in the Ten Commandments? For in and of myself, I'm not able to do it. So guardrail number five. The lawgiver himself enables us to live what he commands. The lawgiver himself enables us to live what he commands. Get this. One day, the lawgiver comes down from the top of the mountain, all the way down, all the way down, and becomes one of us. Yahweh comes down as Jesus, Yeshua in Hebrew, Yahweh to the rescue. And as one of us, born under the law, as the Apostle Paul puts it in his letter to the Galatians, Galatians 5, 4, 5, in the fullness of time, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem us from all our failures to keep the law. How? How does he redeem us? Not by discarding the law, not by watering it down to fit our condition. That's the era of liberalism. Not by rubbing the law in our face or banging the law over our heads. That's the era of fundamentalism. Yahweh, to the rescue, does two unexpected and amazing things. First, he takes on our failure and takes on the consequences of our failure. Again, the Apostle Paul puts it vividly in his letter to the Colossians, Colossians 2.14. Christ has utterly wiped out the damning evidence of broken laws and commandments, which always hung over our heads, and has completely annulled it by nailing it over his head on the cross. The lawgiver comes down from the mountain, enters the valley of transgression and rebellion, and then climbs up another mountain. And on that mountain, on Calgary, the lawgiver takes upon himself the judgment the lawbreakers deserve. And through that act, restores the broken relationship and lifts the crippling guilt. Yahweh to the rescue brings us back into that relationship for which he longs. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And then he does a second thing. He empowers us to obey. The two actions always go together in Scripture, forgiveness and empowerment. As a human being, Jesus Christ perfectly lives the good law. Yes, we say, but he had an advantage. He was the Son of God. He was God the Son. True. The very life of God dwelt in him, enabling him to live consistent with the divine blueprint. But what does the gospel say? 
What happens to people Jesus calls into relationship, into discipleship? Does he not transfer that same advantage to us? Yes, he does. Yahweh to the rescue breathes his spirit into us, granting us his supernatural power to live the life of intimacy and freedom. Again, Paul puts it so well in his letter to the Romans, Romans 8, 3 to 4. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, flesh means self-empowered living, what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk in the power of the flesh, in our own power, but according to the power of the Spirit." So Jesus Christ overcomes the problem of our inability by taking on our sin and sending the Spirit. He forgives us and empowers us. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that Israel celebrated the giving of the law as a gift of grace, as a gift of saving grace, and did so at the Feast of Pentecost. Is it any coincidence that Jesus Christ poured out his Spirit on his followers at Pentecost? No coincidence at all. For the spirit of Yahweh comes to enable the people of Yahweh to live Yahweh's design for human life. On that day when God spoke from the mountaintop, engulfed in fire and smoke, the people were told to write the law on their wristbands and on a band that dangled before their eyes. So zealous was God for their freedom that God even told them to write the commandments on the doorpost of their house which if you were watching The Chosen, you'll see every time someone goes in and out a door, they touch the law that's written on the doorpost and to write it on the gates in front of their house. Supposedly, seeing the law in and out every day would engender obedience. Now, it did help, but only for a while because the problem was the heart. It still is the problem. So God makes a new covenant a new arrangement. The new covenant, Jesus says, is sealed by his blood. And remember what it entails? Knowing God, having God as our God, we being his people, forgiving and forgetting our sin, and God says, I will put my law within them and on their heart. I will write it. That is what the spirit of the giver of the law comes to do. He comes to do heart surgery, if you will, not to insert a pacemaker, but to write the good law on our hearts. The Holy Spirit comes to make us new covenant people, taking the freedom law off tablets of stone, off the doorpost, off the wristbands, off courtroom and schoolroom walls, and engraving them in the flesh of our heart. Now, in light of this, I think you will agree with me in the way I'm now going to conclude. Guardrail six. The commandments turn out to be promises. The commandments turn out to be promises. Why? Because when the living God speaks, his word not only informs, it performs. God's word brings into being what it announces. Let there be light. And there was lots of it. Lazarus come out and a dead man walks out of the tomb. God's word of command brings into being what he commands. The Ten Commandments turn out to be ten promises. And because of what he does in the sending of his son and his spirit, God's you shall not turns out being God's you will. So, hear the gospel in the law. I'm Yahweh, your God, who made you, who became one of you, who went to the cross to free you from the consequences of your rebellious heart. I'm Yahweh, your God, who comes to live with you and in you, giving you a new heart. Therefore, because I am who I am and because I have done for you what I have done for you, one day you will have no other gods before me. There will be nothing between us. One day, you will have no distorted ideas of who I am. You will know me as I really am. One day, you will not use my name in vain. You will pray with great boldness. One day, you will live a holy, sabbatically rhythm of life. 
One day you will honor your mother and father. One day you will not murder. One day you will not commit adultery. One day you will not steal. One day you will not bear false witness against anyone. And one day you will not covet because you will be so satisfied in me and my love. Make it so, Lord, for the glory of Jesus. Make it so. Well, I want to thank you for listening to today's sermon. I'm Jason. I'm one of the pastors at The Way Church. And if you want to find out more about what's going on in the life of our church or how to get connected more deeply, you can go to thewaychurch.ca. We're so encouraged to hear stories about how these messages have been strengthening people in their walk with God, drawing them deeper in their relationship with Him and in His Word. And so this is love from our team to you. Hope you're doing well today and love to hear from you.